King Alant the Twelfth, by channeling the power of souls, brought unprecedented prosperity to his northern kingdom of Boletaria. That is, until the colorless deep fog swept across the land. Boletaria was cut off from the outside world, and those who dared penetrate the deep fog never returned. But Valarfax of the royal twin fangs broke free from the fog and told the world of Boletaria's plight. That the old king Alant had aroused the old one, the great beast below the nexus from its eternal slumber, and that a colorless fog had swept in, unleashing terrible demons. The demons hunt down men and claim their souls. Those who lose their souls also lose their minds. The mad attack the sane, and chaos reigns. Valarfax spoke of the enticing power of the demon souls. Each time a demon claims a human soul, the demon's own soul is invigorated by the life force. And the power of a mature demon soul is beyond human imagination. The legend spread quickly. Mighty warriors were drawn to the accursed land. But none have returned. Bjor of the Twin Fangs. Yurt the Silent Chief. Sage Urbane. Skurver the Wanderer. The Sixth Saint Astraea and her knight Garl Vinland. And Sage Freik the Visionary. The colorless deep fog slowly creeps beyond Boletaria's borders. Humankind faces a slow and steady extinction. The deep fog will eventually swallow all lands near and far. But Boletaria has one final hope. A lone warrior who has braved the baneful fog. Has the land found its savior? Or have the demons found a new slave? There's just a quick comment I need to make before we get started. Every Dark Souls player remembers that skeleton graveyard that was positioned right next to Firelink Shrine. And many players, I think most players, blundered in there uh, when the, on their first playthrough and got completely wrecked by those skeletons. This cutscene is that skeleton graveyard. Even though it's at the beginning of our lessons, because it's at the beginning of the game, it contains a lot of material that will require a great deal of explanation, and some of the newer students are going to experience a significant sense of information overload. Now that's to be expected, and if you feel that way, don't be discouraged. Just keep in mind that FromSoft made this cutscene and its narration for native Japanese speakers at full adult levels of literacy. Juni Dai, 12th generation. So we have our very first Chinese character, and it's a relatively easy one. The Chinese characters that are employed in Japanese are probably the core element driving the fear factor that exists when it comes to learning Japanese. But really, these characters break down into two broad categories. There's the very simple, easy, indivisible characters, and then there are the more complicated looking ones that if you squint at them you'll quickly realize that they're just different combinations of the simpler ones. Now as we take a look at the character Dai, you see it has a left and right half. The left half is the man to the left radical. It's just about the most common radical of all time and one of the most common graphemes. So whenever you see that little man standing to the left of a character, it means that that character has something to do with human behavior or existence. Soru, soul. This is just the English word for soul, although they've garbled a little bit because they don't have an L in their language. So here you have the dirty little secret of learning Japanese to play games. And that secret is, a lot of it is English to begin with. Any Japanese game you're likely to play these days is going to be absolutely chock full of English words written in katakana. 
I'll put some videos in the description that will help you get up to speed with katakana, although there's a lot of good resources for that. Normally, students are advised to learn hiragana first, then katakana, then start learning kanji. But for what we're doing, I actually recommend that you learn katakana first, because it's a great confidence booster to be able to recognize words right off the bat. Totsujo, suddenly. So here's our very first own compound. This is one of about a zillion Chinese loan words that exist in Japanese. The first character means to thrust or stab, and the second character means like or in such a manner. So when you combine thrust and like, you get suddenly. Irai, since. The first character in this expression is a very special character. It means from a certain point onward. So this is used for comparative expressions. So wherever you see a two character compound and that character is first, that first character, that E, defines a certain point in space, time, amount, or degree. And the second character determines a direction. Now the second character in this word that we're looking at means what is to come. So irai means from the point that was being discussed onward or since. Sono, that. Tada, but. Sake me, tear or rip. We've already seen a couple of own compounds. This is our first kun compound. Sake comes from sakeru, meaning to rip or tear something. And me, the third character, is I. So the result is sake me, which means an I shaped tear in something. Kusabi, linchpin. Kusabi is the nexus. They seem to have changed the name because the word linchpin, or wooden wedge, doesn't have much of a ring to it. As you'll see in the cutscene later with the monumental, the arch stones are strewn about the land of Boletaria approximately in a wheel, and the linchpin, Kusabi, sits in the center. A linchpin meaning a wooden bolt that keeps a wagon wheel on its axle. Now if you look at the components that make this character up, that skinny part on the left side, that's the tree to the left radical. The tree radical designates either wood, nature in general, various plants, and also carpentry and construction. Ro'o, old king. Nothing fancy going on here. Old plus king makes old king. Iro, color. This character is not too hard to remember, but I have always had the mnemonic device myself to imagine that it's a little monster. You see the horn and its eyes, and the line at the bottom is kind of like a jaw. Now every single component of a character, whether it occurs as a radical or not, they're called graphemes and they all have official names. But playing little visual mnemonic games is really important for a high level of retention. So it's fine to treat characters or parts of characters like they're clouds. Just stare at them and whatever it is you see, work that into some mnemonic device. Daemon, demon. So here we have another English word. It's written in katakana, and you'll notice there's that bar in the middle after the de. That stretches out the vowel of the sound that comes before it. So de becomes de. So it seems when demon came into Japanese as a loan word, it was back in the day where it was spelled D-A-E-M-O-N, daemon. Ubawarata, deprived or plundered. Now there's four characters here, one kanji and three kana. Now to understand what's going on here, a little bit of explanation is required. Let's suppose that we're trying to make a new pictographical writing system for English. We're going to keep the Roman alphabet if we need it, but we're going to try to substitute as many different words with symbols so that it's easier to read. We'll start with the word stop. From now on, we're going to take a red octagon, which people already associate with the concept of stop, and we're going to write that instead of the word stop. So now, Whenever you're reading a text, you don't have that problem where you read something and you realize that you're halfway down the page and you, and you're not, you haven't processed any of it. You no longer have that problem because everything's in pictures. So you can skim something relatively briskly and you still have a very high level of, uh, of comprehension. So it's a very good system for that reason. But let's say that you want more words that can mean stop. Let's say you want halt or cease. Well, you could come up with additional pictures for them, or you could just keep using the red octagon. But just to make sure we know how to read something out loud when we see the red octagon on the page, we're going to make the last letter or few letters of each word stick out 
so that way there's no room for confusion. So here we have stop, halt, and cease. The other advantage of doing it this way is now we can use all the different permutations of these words without having to come up with a different symbol by just changing the endings. So now we have stopped, halting, ceaseless. That's essentially what's going on with this word ubawarata and many words like it. It takes the root word ubao, meaning to plunder, and changes the ending so now it is ubawarata, has been plundered. Shoki, sanity. The character on the left means correct. The character on the right has three different layers of meaning. Physically, it can mean a gas or vapor. Mentally, it can mean mood. And in a more supernatural context, it can mean a spirit or spirit energy. So in the context of this word, you would probably translate it as mind. So shoki, correct mind, straight mind, sanity. Vararufaksu, Valorfax. In addition to writing English and other foreign language words, katakana is also used to write made-up fantasy names. The problem you'll run into is that there's a lot of sounds that they just don't make in Japanese, so they never really developed a way to write them. Now here, they've taken the katakana for u and added these dakaten, those dirtying marks, to the upper right, and that makes it go from an u to a v, and then they have an external vowel next to it, the a, ah, the miniaturized katakana next to it. So they found a workaround for their lack of a V sound in their native language, but for whatever reason, they never implemented a workaround for their lack of an L sound. It seems to me like they could just take ra ri ru re ro and add dakten to them and make la li lu le lo, but they don't and there's nothing we can do about it, so every time you come across a fantasy name that has any R sounds, it could be an R or it could be an L. You just have to guess or ask the person who made it. Tachi, pluralizer. Plurals aren't handled the same way in Japanese as they are in English, not by a long shot. Most nouns in Japanese don't really change between single and plural forms. There are some cases, however, where you want to make an explicit plural for some reason. So, out of context, daemon could mean a demon, two demons, three demons, or 10,000 demons, and it's still going to be written the same way. A pluralizing suffix is only in those cases where the writer feels the need to clarify that it's multiple. But for pluralizing suffixes like tachi, it doesn't always mean more of the same. So let's say we give an invitation to Valorfax, and the invitation reads, To the Honorable Mr. Valorfax, this is an invitation for Valorfax plus one. We're not expecting two people named Valorfax to show up. We're expecting Valorfax to show up with a guest that he brings with him of his choice. This is something you always have to keep in mind when you look at these emphatic pluralizing suffixes. Daemon tachi can mean demons, plural, as in more than one demon, or it could mean a demon and people with the demon. In this context, it seems clear that they're talking about multiple demons. Or they could be talking about the demons and their brainwashed insane followers. But if it read, for example, Valorfax tachi, that's not talking about multiple Valorfaxes. It would be talking about Valorfax and some people with him, some companions, compatriots, maybe his family, anything like that. Sore, that. Now you'll remember, we already learned sono, which also translates as that. Sono is that when you're modifying another word, another noun, and sore is a pronoun that can stand on its own two feet. Jingai, inhuman. The character on the left means person or human being, and the character on the right means outside. So, outside of humanity means inhuman. If you take these same two characters and switch them around, it becomes the word gaijin, meaning a foreigner or outsider. Boletaria. Boletaria. Now here we have again, in made-up fantasy names, when you have R's, they could be R's or L's. It's only because we have an official source telling us it's boletaria that we know that it's boletaria. Otherwise, it could be boritaria, boritalia, boletaria, or Boletalia, and they would all be equally likely possibilities. Oku, many. Even though this is transliterated with two O's, it's not uku. It's oku, two O's in a row, with a very slight glottal stop separating them. Soshite, thus. Mo, already. Chinmoku, Silent.
This word Chinmoku has two really important radicals I want you to take note of. The character Chin has on its left side three drops of water for the water to the left radical. The character Moku has four little dots of flame in a row, like someone has put it on a gas stove and turned the flames on. And that makes the fire underneath radical. Seija, saint. Se means sacred or holy. And the character on the right can be Sha, Ja, or Mono, depending on the word. And it means a person, but differs from the character for person or human that we saw before. This character emphasizes someone who has a certain profession or engages in a certain kind of activity. So Seija could be interpreted as holy person or person whose job it is to be holy. Now if you take a close look at the character for Se, you'll see it's made up of three graphemes, each of which are pretty important. At the bottom is King, which we've already seen as its own character when we looked at Old King. The upper left component is Ear, and is a picture of an ear. The upper right component is a picture of a mouth. So remember what I said earlier about mnemonics and word games. Take a look at this character, knowing that it means sacred or holy, and that it's composed of Ear, Mouth, and King, and come up with some little phrase, it can be completely nonsensical, Come up with some phrase that combines the concepts of ear, mouth, and king to mean sacred or holy, or to act as a reminder of the meaning of sacred or holy. Horo sha, wanderer. Horo is to wander, and sha is the same as ja in the previous word, except that now it hasn't been dirtied. It's a pure sha instead of a dirtied ja. Dairoku, sixth. The character on the right is the character for six, and the character on the left, Dai, is a special character that makes something an ordinal instead of a cardinal number. So, one, two, three, four, five, six are your cardinals. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth are examples of ordinal numbers. The other thing you want to notice is on top of that first character, there's two little nubs. That's the bamboo on top radical, and is another important radical you'll want to learn. Now, there's a hefty handful of plant names that have characters that use the bamboo radical. But you'll most typically see the bamboo on top radical when it comes to characters that deal with accounting, bookkeeping, and record keeping. Apparently, this dates back to when people used bamboo scrolls before the advent of paper in China. Hirakumono, person who clears a path. Hiraku is a verb meaning to clear, like to clear a path or to clear a patch of land. And mono can mean person or thing, depending on the context. If you look at the very first character, you'll see it's divided into left and right halves like so many other characters. The left-hand side is the hand-to-the-left radical, and this radical occurs on a wide variety of characters that deal with things you do with your hands. The right-hand side of the character is made up of the stone grapheme, which looks like the mouth grapheme but with two extra lines added over it. Iro no nai, colorless, or without color. We've already seen iro, color, Nai is actually the negative form of a verb meaning to have, or for there to be. No is a grammatical particle that we'll look into more in the future. But for now, all you need to know is that if something says X no nai, it means without X. Hitobito, people. We saw the character for Hito before in the expression Jingai. But before, we saw it as Jin, which is one of its own readings, and now it's Hito, which is one of its Kun readings. Kanji can have several different readings, that's something you just need to get used to. Now, the character on the right is actually a symbol. It's not truly a kana or a kanji. What it does is it clones the character that comes before it. So this kanji, with that symbol, are read out loud the same way as if you had written that first kanji twice in a row. But then you have another problem, because it's not pronounced hito hito, it's pronounced hito bito. Being in the second position can change a consonant, and it becomes its voiced or dirtied version. If you watch the katakana video in the description, you'll see that many kana have a sort of sister kana that has these marks to the upper right. So when a sound becomes voiced, it goes from the version without the marks to the version with the marks. Now if this is your first encounter with Japanese phonetics and spelling conventions, it can seem a bit confusing, but in the long run it's fairly consistent. Yagate, eventually. 
Saigo, Final, Horobi, Ruin. At the risk of sounding cynical, I'm going to wager that there's relatively few of you left at this point. But if you have made it this far, regardless of what your actual level of comprehension and retention was, you should be proud of yourself for the simple fact that you haven't given up yet. In the next video, we'll start our journey to the Nexus, and from this point on, the pace of the videos should be a lot quicker. I was forced to use stills from the cutscene in order to have time to cover everything, but during the actual gameplay, I'll just superimpose the information as I do the explanation and continue playing. So I'll see you on the other side of the fog.